Copyright Stanford University. All rights reserved.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth annual uh, Normandy Shumway Lecture. And uh, it, indeed, it's a very special pleasure today to have Dr. Sarah Shumway uh, deliver this year's lecture. 
Uh, although Sarah was born in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, the birthplace of Michael DeBakey, uh, she grew up in, yeah, that's right. <laughs> she grew up in Palo Alto and, and chose to stay on the farm for her undergraduate studies before going to Vanderbilt for uh, her medical school uh, time. She then uh, moved to Johns Hopkins to complete her general surgery and cardiothoracic training with Bruce Wrights, and then uh, became an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota in 1988. Uh, was, uh, uh, she earned tenure in 1993 and promoted to the rank of full professor in 1996. Sarah is a, an accomplished uh, surgeon, a researcher, and dedicated teacher and mentor. Um, it's great to have her family here today, uh, Mary Lou, her mother, uh, Lisa, her sister, and uh, Mike, her brother, as well as uh, Sienna, her niece, who uh, got a pass from school today to be able to come to this special event. Um, so please join me in welcoming Sarah, who's going to share her thoughts today about VADS and DAD. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and thank you, Bobby, for those kind words. Uh, I realized that I had originally titled the talk Vads and Dads, but there's really just one dad in particular that I'm going to discuss, uh, the father of the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Stanford. And um, I also want to thank the members of my entourage for coming, and basically that's anybody who's known me for more than 10 years. You know who you are. <laughs> First off, um, as many of you know, especially those in cardi cardiology, there are some reversible causes of heart dysfunction. Uh, it's the so-called hibernating myocardium. One of my cardiology uh, colleagues calls that siesta sarcomeres, uh, myocardium that can come back when it's reperfused, stunned myocardium, such as uh, in a patient like a postmenopausal woman with a stress-induced cardiomyopathy. That's usually short-lived. Uh, Sepsis-associated myocardial depression is something we see sometimes in our lung transplant patients that responds to a tincture of time and a lot of antibiotics. Uh, myocardial dysfunction after cardiopulmonary bypass, thankfully we don't see that as often as we used to. And myocarditis when, when virus or giant cells have attacked the myocardium. And we have many more surgical options for the treatment of congestive heart failure than we used to have. Of course, uh, with heart transplants, there are a finite number of patients that we can help. The big year for heart transplantation was 1994 when 4,400 transplants occurred. But now we're down to about 3,300 worldwide, and we're staying at that level. So the other uh, surgical options we have include a CAB, Oh, technical difficulties. A cab with a VAD repair, with a valve repair or replacement. Sometimes we have VAD backup for those procedures, VAD being a ventricular assist device. Biventricular pacing with certain QRS complexes. This is an option, but it's very important that the left ventricular lead be appropriately placed. A lot of times when we go in to do a heart transplant, we check where the lead has been positioned and find that it was less than ideal. Surgical ventricular remodeling is something they have a lot of experience with at Hopkins. We don't do it very much at, at Minnesota. Myocardial restraints are used a lot uh, in our VA population. Of course, heart transplantation. And then there are devices, left ventricular assist devices, that we can use to bridge patients to a transplant or to recovery and explantation of the device. Stem cell research, you have that very nice building nearby, and we're all learning how we can appropriately, appropriately apply stem cells. And the device as destination therapy has only recently started to, to be done. So the three main applications of left ventricular assist devices are as a bridge to transplantation, destination therapy where the patient wears the device until they die or need a new device, and as a bridge to recovery or short-term support. The rematch trial uh, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001. 
and was the randomized evaluation of me me mechanical assistance versus medical therapy for the treatment of congestive heart failure. And what was remarkable about this project was that it was stopped uh, prematurely because the survival was so much better in the patients who received mechanical support. Women were underrepresented in this trial. Generally speaking, women are about 28% of the, of the heart transplant recipients. And in the medical arm of this uh, project, they were 18%. In the surgical arm, they were 22%. Preoperatively, we like to have as much information as we can glean on these potential VAD recipients. We do a right heart cath to make sure that the right heart hasn't become a passive conduit. If all the pressures are the same and the right heart is uh, not functioning to some degree, then we need to place a right ventricular assist device at the same time. And those patients don't do as well as the ones who just require a left ventricular assist device. We get an echo ahead of time as well to really look at all, all the structures of the heart a coronary angiogram so that if we felt it appropriate, we would do a bypass to the right coronary system as that might help the overall right ventricular function. Carotid Dopplers to make sure that the patients will wake up after the surgery. A GFR to know for sure that the kidney function will be reasonable. In Minnesota, a patient who has a left ventricular assist device and requires dialysis is not placeable anywhere. And we also have found it reasonable and helpful to get a CT angio of the chest and abdomen, especially in the patient that we suspect of being a vasculopath. In the operating room, the assessment continues. Uh, once the patient is asleep, we do a transesophageal echo to rule out the presence of a patent foramen ovale or a small connection between the two upper chambers of the heart. Certainly this could be a source of desaturation in the perioperative period, and so that gets closed. We also evaluate the aortic valve, both pre and post implant, and we rule out the presence of floating thrombus, which unfortunately we have seen from time to time, and we'll actually remove the device to remove the thrombus. It also helps us gauge how well the assist device is working by showing us how well the left ventricle has been decompressed. And it also shows us how well the inflow cannula has been positioned and allows us to evaluate for intracardiac error. The aortic valve is very important in that if there is incompetence of the aortic valve with a continuous flow LVAD, we, we close it off because then if, if we didn't, then the blood flow from the outflow graft that's supposed to go systemically would go backwards into the left ventricle decreasing the amount of, of true flow from the ventricular assist device. If the native valve is normal or stenotic, we can just leave it alone. Prosthetic valves are a little bit different. If there's a mechanical aortic valve in place, we will do a patch closure, usually using Dacron, and a circular patch is used and uh, secured to the walls of the aorta. If there's a bioprosthetic valve, we don't have to do much. So this is what it looks like in a schematic of the original HeartMate. And this, you can see, is quite a large, cumbersome device with the inflow cannula going into the left ventricle and the outflow graft going into the aorta. And this is what it looks like in situ with um, the outflow graft. This is the heart itself and the uh, inflow cannula here, the outflow graft here. But fortunately, over time, these devices continued to get better and smaller. The old device was a pulsatile flow LVAD. It was large, noisy, and it rested either on the surface of the peritoneum or into the peritoneal cavity. And the patients after surgery would quite often be troubled with uh, small, small bowel obstructions or ventral hernias. With the continuous flow device, you can see that it's quite a bit smaller. And and uh, it has one moving part, and it has a much smaller lead or drive line. Intermax is a, is a component of the ISHLT's registry that keeps track of all the patients who have received mechanical assist support. And over the last four years, they've uh, kept a record on over two, two, 26 uh, 
hundred patients. And you can see that for the most part, these are patients receiving left ventricular assist devices. About 10% receive BIVADs, and only 3% are receiving total artificial hearts. This uh, demonstrates the orange line is the continuous flow pump, and the green line is the pulsatile flow pump. So you can see that, that with the HeartMate 2 devices, we're getting much better results, and, and with the other continuous flow pumps as well. One year survival was only 67% in the pulse, pulsatile flow group. It's 83% in the continuous flow group. And for two, month, two years survival, it was 45% in the pulsatile flow pump and 75% with the continuous flow group. And so this is what the configuration now looks like with the HeartMate 2 device, which has been approved for destination therapy. It works even in aging, <laughs> snarky Republicans. And it can put a smile on their face, even. There are certain other key components of the device system. There's a microprocessor or controller that delivers power to the pump. It controls the pump speed and, and um, does diagnostic monitoring. It provides a complete backup system. And it also indicates hazards and alarms. And it has a data logging uh, capabilities. There are three potential power sources for it, an AC power, a DC power from lithium ion batteries, and an emergency power pack. And this is what the console looks like in the operating room, and we drag it around with the patients while they're in the hospital and when they come back for clinic checks. But we uh, check their pump speed, and uh, generally speaking, we start out with a pump speed around 8,400. When we have patients who weigh as much as 130 kilograms, then we'll go up to a pump speed of about 9,200. We check the pulse index and pump power. Recently, uh, Bogayev and her colleagues at uh, Baylor, Texas Heart, University of Alabama, and other locales compared the outcomes of women versus men using the continuous flow left ventricular assist device as a bridge to transplantation. And they found in almost 500 patients that after 18 months, there was really no difference in survival. But more women on, were on support after 18 months. And the median duration of support was longer for women than for men. The mortality was pretty similar, though, 20% for women and 19% for men. Hemorrhagic stroke was more frequent in women, but device-related infections occurred more frequently in men. This is the smaller acuter device, but just because it's smaller doesn't mean it's better. Uh, in particular, it seems to be a little bit fussier to use. It has an uh, inflow cannula that's smaller, and this is the site for the outflow graft. But it's quite a bit smaller. It, it can be held in the palm of one's hand. And you can see that the drive line here is quite small and, uh, and actually has to be coiled up within the chest. And this is the uh, hardware device. It's, it's not FDA approved. And we've uh, used it only about 10 times at the University of Minnesota, so we don't have a great deal of experience with it. It doesn't seem to be as effective in the larger patient. And a lot of our patients are, are larger, more than 100 kilograms. Stuber and his colleagues at, uh, in Hanover, Germany, just reported on a multi-center evaluation of this device. And they uh, had a total of 50 patients. 40% received transplants. There were four other international centers between, besides Hanover. Eight were bridged to recovery and explanted. 34% were still on support, and 18% died. So we're still learning a lot about this new, smaller device. And there are certain do's and don'ts with uh, VAD device therapy. All the usual protocols still are uh, utilized. Chest compressions can be used. We, we still use the usual x-rays, EKGs, and CT scans. But we can't use the MRI, as that will stop the pump. And if it's known that the device has been off for more than 10 minutes, it shouldn't be restarted, as it can contain clot and cause uh, embolic phenomena. The post-operative issues are quite often the same issues that are seen in the patients preoperatively. 
such as arrhythmias. And in particular, we've had patients with very bad ventricular tachycardia who have had placement of a left ventricular assist device and then can better tolerate an ablation procedure in the cath lab and get rid of their VTAC. Shortness of breath, lower extremity edema, hypertension, hypotension still occur. INR goals can be different from the various, for the various VADs and can be different for various patients, especially the ones that have difficulties with GI bleeding. And of course, these patients are not immune to further operations, and so we have to monitor their anticoagulation very carefully. Uh, driveline infections are sort of the bane of our existence with this device. Usually we can just get by with placing the patients on either oral or IV antibiotics, but sometimes it's necessary to actually dissect out the driveline and wrap it in omentum to get rid of a persistent driveline infection. And generally speaking, patients with heart failure don't do well with any kind of infection. These are the potential complications, bleeding and uh, We've got that under control most of the time, uh, and we have a very uh, aggressive uh, cardi cardiac anesthesia group that help us a lot with that. Activated factor seven has aided us on more than one occasion. Embolic phenomenon, especially the hemorrhagic stroke we have seen more often in women. Infections such as the uh, sternal wound actually falling apart and exposing the device, thankfully, is seen very rarely. And then the, the catastrophic situation with multi-organ system failure. This is a, an instance of an infected driveline. You can see a little erythema around the driveline insertion. And we've had uh, some help in dealing with that by using uh, platelet gel in the perioperative period and injecting the area where the driveline emerges from the anterior abdominal wall with platelet gel and then closing off this area with a stitch that we don't remove for two weeks and that's cut down on our number of driveline infections. We've also gotten involved in temporary support for uh, heart failure and we've a lot of places like the Cleveland Clinic would use ECMO for temporary support. At the University of Minnesota, we've had a different philosophy in that regard. And uh, we're still learning when is the appropriate time to use the support for how long and when, when the appropriate time is to transition to a permanent ventricular assist device. This is sort of our algorithm for treating these patients. They come in with uh, acute refractory cardiogenic shock. They may or may not have multi-organ system failure and have had a cardiac arrest. And then they get placed on a centromag uh, biventricular support. If um, they have neurologic recovery and cardiac recovery, we can explant them. If they have neurologic recovery but no cardiac recovery, we place a heartmate device. And if they have no neurologic recovery or cardiac recovery, support is withdrawn. This is how we cannulate for these patients. We play, for the RVAD component, we place a cannula in the right atrium and the pulmonary artery. And for the LVAD component, we place uh, the cannula in the right superior pulmonary vein and in the aorta. We, we've done this uh, in 56 patients over a recent four-year period, and 34 of these were a bridge to decision. 11 were patients who'd had a heart transplant or had had a ventricular assist device placed, a left ventricular assist device, and six patients had had heart surgery. Five just received RVADs. And then uh, this expanded to a larger multi-center trial where you can see that the women were well represented at 39%. And this was done in patients after a cardiotomy, after a large acute MI, or an RVAD was placed after a patient had had a left ventricular assist device. These are very challenging patients, and you can see that their 30-day survival is not great. The cardiotomy group was the lowest at 44%, 50% 30-day survival in the post-MI group, but 58% in the patients who received RVADs after placement of an LVAD. This is an interesting patient that we took care of recently, a younger uh, patient who collapsed while engaged in an uh, athletic event. And he had uh, CPR on the scene. They attempted to defibrillate him and were not successful. And uh, so he had an Abiumed biventricular assist system placed at an outside hospital and five days later was transferred to the University of Minnesota. In two to three weeks, we were able to wean him off the Centromag that we placed 
And about a week later, we echoed him and found this thrombus in his left ventricle. So he also had a similar size thrombus in his right ventricle, so he was taken back to the operating room and had an apical ventriculotomy, and uh, the thrombus in the right ventricle was approached via the right atrium, and he has since done well. Stem cell research is uh, still in its infancy, thanks in part to the Bush administration not supporting it uh, very much. Uh, this article came out in the New York Times in 2005, saying that uh, there had been great hope starting in April of 2001 when they were able to place stem cells from mice uh, in, into their damaged hearts and had recovery. But uh, four years later, after several clinical trials, there had seemed to be minimal recovery in patients. And so there are certain questions that still exist about how we should approach the use of stem cells. And I'm sure a lot of the answers will come from the group working on stem cell research here. But we don't really know what the prognosis is for stem ther therapy to repair heart damage. And uh, we don't know whether, whether it's going to be one cell therapy or multiple ones. And uh, we don't really know how much repair and regeneration we're going to get. It's not like the... Uh, like multiple myeloma that clearly responds to stem cell therapy. And furthermore, it seems that less than 5% of the cells transplanted are present two weeks later, and the supernatant of the stem cell cultures are equally effect is equally effective. So it's kind of a paracrine mechanism. And so ideally, with, with placement of a left ventricular assist device, we would uh, administer stem cells at the same time. And there are clinical trials ongoing and we're still trying to get it through our IRB at the University of Minnesota. In terms of the research that's ongoing in uh, left ventricular assist devices at the University of Minnesota, we're involved in single and multi-center studies. We're doing both invasive and non-invasive monitoring of endothelial function. We're, uh, the two main complications have been gastrointestinal bleeding and renal function, so we're investigating those all the time. We, we still don't understand what the real markers are for ventricular recovery, and precious few of our patients have uh, been bridged to recovery. And we do hope to use the LVAD as a platform for stem cells. I think in terms of future applications of ventricular assist devices, we know that adults with congenital heart disease don't do as well with heart transplants, and this might be a good group. Uh, women who have had uh, four or more pregnancies are at increased risk for antibody-mediated rejection, and these might be appropriate VAD candidates. And certainly the older woman who is over age 70 at the time of presentation with heart failure might be an appropriate VAD candidate as well as the adolescent who has not yet reached the age of reason and might better handle a VAD than a complicated drug regimen. There are certain contraindications as well to implanting a VAD. Mitral stenosis such that the, the blood doesn't get to the left ventricle, a restrictive cardiomyopathy where the heart doesn't dilate, uh, certainly a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where the ventricle is so thick the inflow cannula won't really get into the left ventricle, and cardiac tumors. This is an interesting heart. It resembles almost a football more than a heart. And this was a lady who was listed on a Friday morning and got her transplant on that same Friday night. That rarely happens. And uh, she had a biopsy of her right ventricle, and they saw lymphoma, but it was thought to be a floater. But it turned out it was the real thing. And you can see that this is where she has real myocardium, and she was, and this is, the rest of her heart is all lymphoma. So sticking an inflow cannula in here wouldn't be of very great assistance. At Minnesota, we're still trying to deal with the basic uh, problems in immunology. Uh, Ryan Shellstead has done some good work in our laboratory in mice, looking at inflammatory and suppressive graft antigens specific CD4 T cells that coexist in heart allografts. And really what they found that, it, what we found in this model was that it was a minor mismatched model. And they found a new population of CD4 T lymphocytes that could potentially be targeted uh, in terms of immunosuppression in the future. So even, even in the work, even our work in mice will hopefully help us make sure that the heart transplants work for a good long time. 
And since this is sort of a two-pronged talk, now we're, we're in the dad phase. And uh, this is uh, Norman Edward Shumway Sr. And you can see he bears uh, dad, uh, looked like him quite a bit. Uh, you can see he has the telltale cigarette, and thankfully dad was a tobacco virgin and was always very proud of that. And this is a picture at the home dairy where uh, he worked for many years with his wife, Laura. And Laura uh, was the daughter of Dutch immigrants, and uh, she was the kind of person who would give people free meals if they didn't have the money to pay for it during the Depression. So they didn't do very well from a financial vantage point. Uh, Dad was uh, thought to be most likely to succeed when he was in high school. You can see this is sort of a staged uh, photo. And uh, here uh, he's described as a man of few words but great meaning. And this was probably because his mother did talk almost all the time. Um, he was in assembly, but what he really enjoyed was debate club, and this would serve him very well for dealing mostly with deans. Uh, from from uh, high school, he spent uh, six months at a junior college and then went to the University of Michigan. And unfortunately, he started at the University of Michigan in September of 1941. And on December 7th of 1941, World War II started for the United States. So about 18 months later, he and one of his buddies enlisted because they knew they were going to get drafted. And they were hoping to be jet pilots. But because he had uh, buck teeth, and apparently that causes you to have deformed maxillary sinuses, he couldn't be a jet pilot. So he was very fortunate that he couldn't be a jet pilot because the guy he enlisted with was and died during flight training. So he took a test to determine whether he would be suitable as a dentist or a doctor in the Army. And fortunately, he decided he would rather be a doctor and spent, spent some time spinning his wheels before an opportunity became available to start medical school at Vanderbilt. And this was one of his good buddies, Shirley Townsend. And the reason why he was such a good buddy was he would loan him his convertible. At, uh, at, at Vanderbilt, Dad was mostly influenced by the neurosurgeons there, and one in particular was Cobb Pilcher. And he originally wanted to do neurosurgery, but he spent a summer at the MGH and found that they were mostly talking about what was being done at the University of Minnesota. So that was when he, would, he decided he wanted to go to the University of Minnesota. He started there in 1949 and spent two years there and met my mother, and they got married. But he decided to join the Air Force Reserve because the big war had already been fought and he needed the money. And then along came the Korean conflict. So here he is, a captain in the Air Force, and my brother looks a lot like him in this picture. And uh, he was stationed in San Antonio and Lake Charles, Louisiana, where I was born. And uh, he often recalled the time that he was the SOD and there was a terrible car accident and one of his uh, co-members co of the troop was injured rather severely and they called for everybody to donate blood. And one of the members of the troop was an African American, but they wouldn't allow him to donate. So he has a nice rant in the uh, SOD minutes. So he returned to the University of Minnesota, determined to get his PhD in hypothermia, and I can assure you that there's no finer place to study hypothermia than Minnesota. And he uh, did most of his work with uh, F. John Lewis in the laboratory, but the person he learned a lot from was Walt Lillehei in the operating room. And Walt was a very good idea man. He wasn't always the person you would want to execute the idea, and that's why the team of Lillehei and Varco was so uh, excellent working together. When dad was at uh, Minnesota, he was described as being the most irreverent of all the people at the University of Minnesota, and I'm sure you all know why that is. In, uh, this is my first uh, claim to fame. In uh, 1954, this was in the local newspaper. Help from father, Norman J. Shumway, Jr. Uh, dresses his daughter Sarah, 18 months. The American father, 1954 model, is a versatile gentleman who can dress a child, cook a meal, and likes to do the family marketing. Bet bet between cases. Now, uh, when they got started, uh, 
after uh, he finished at Minnesota, he was offered an opportunity to stay at Minnesota that wasn't really a terrific opportunity. So he decided to go into private practice in Santa Barbara. And he lasted in private practice for six weeks before he was basically fired for, I guess, what was termed insubordination. Uh, he was working with an older guy and he was trying to bring him along, but uh, he didn't like all the new things and so uh, it just didn't work out. So he drove up the coast and had an interview at UCSF that didn't work out, but he did find an opportunity at Stanford to work primarily in the dog lab and to also uh, run their dialysis machine. And, at, and he got paid $3,000 a year to do that. So he was in the laboratory and uh, early on began working with Dick Lauer. And one of their most uh, early projects was to try to determine how to provide uh, myocardial protection to do any kind of surgery. This is one of the older drawings I found in his uh, collected uh, items. And uh, this was when they were doing uh, both direct cannulation of the coronary osteum as well as retrograde cannulation to deliver uh, cold saline and to arrest the heart and uh, do aortic surgery. This was a, another early drawing showing how the different ways they were approaching the mitral valve. And you can see they were doing the usual left atriotomy, but also exploring the possibility of going through the dome of the left atrium and also separating the uh, superior uh, uh, vena cava, just dividing it in half. And this uh, is, is a drawing clearly where, where, where they have placed a Star Edwards valve. But early on, they, they really were interested in looking at myocardial preservation. And so they started doing autographs, cutting the heart out of a dog and sewing it back in. So this is what it looked like once they cut it out. And this is what it looked like after they got it sewn in. And they found they could do this in less than a minute. And the, and the way that it was uh, shortened was they didn't, they cut the left atrial cuff so that the, they didn't have to reimplant each one of the pulmonary veins. And that shortened the procedure a lot. This was one of the early dog hearts. And one of the early concerns was how well would the heart heal. And you can see the arrow to an area where the atrium has healed nicely together. So in, in looking at his curriculum vitae, there is a wonderful, wonderful breadth of uh, activity at Stanford. They moved down to this campus in 1959, as I'm sure most of you know. So the, one of their first uh, papers was on forward versus retrograde coronary perfusion for di direct vision surgery of acquired aortic valvular disease. Next, they looked at autotransplantation of the pulmonic valve into the aorta, uh, the Ross procedure. The uh, preparation, assembly, and operation of a heart-lung machine in 1962. One of the uh, early papers was on results of total surgical correction of fellows tetralogy in 1965. Uh, surgical management of post-infarction VSDs in 1969. And management of acute dissections in 1970. They also had one of the early studies out in 1973 of coronary artery bypass grafting, as well as management of transposition of the great arteries in 1975. This is dad, don't miss the bow tie, look, looking at uh, Ray Stouffer and one of their setups for the heart-lung machine. And in the olden days at uh, Stanford in the city, they would actually have to transport the heart-lung machine from the dog lab to the children's hospital where they would do some of the pediatric work. And in the early days of heart surgery, one of the most important things was to get the word out to people that heart surgery could be done. So dad would appear on doctor's news conference, which was a local program here, as well as do uh, canine surgery in front of the cameras for KPIX. Uh, and then this is Ralphie, the first man or beast to live with another animal's heart for over a year. And this is Ray Stouffer, Dick Lauer, and Dad. And this would be about 1965. And um, in October of 1967, Dad had a paper in JAMA saying the time was ready to do uh, a heart transplant. And then, of course, uh, Barnard was able to do the first one on December 3rd, 1967. And it was on January 6th, 1968, that Dad and Ed Stinson did the first heart transplant here. 
And our mother told us that uh, dad was staying at the hospital because he wasn't feeling very well. So we were watching the birds, uh, and I don't mean angry birds, I mean Alfred Hitchcock, the birds, when the program was interrupted for the following special announcement that the doctors at Stanford had done a heart transplant. And it really was a time when uh, there, well, there was a great deal of publicity, and, um, and Dad was able to stay fairly grounded, but I think a lot of the credit should go to Mom, who uh, kind of kept his feet on the ground and uh, told him where he lived. <laughs> and this was his uh, news conference, and uh, I always want to say, close your mouth, you look smarter, but um, uh, he's describing how to do a heart transplant and uh, to the large group, and he and uh, Don Harrison had a news conference at which they also examined how he rolled a piece of chalk, and that was in the Palo Alto Times as well. And then, of course, uh, with the great work of Ed Stinson getting NIH funding for many years, uh, a, a great deal of work was done. And uh, this is Dad and Bruce Wrights doing the first heart-lung transplant in, uh, on March 9th, 1981, and which really paved the way for lung transplantation as well. Uh, this is uh, Dick Lauer, and uh, he was a friend for life of Dad's. Dad offered him uh, the presidency of the AATS when it was time, and uh, Dick refused, which tells you a lot about the man. After Dad died, uh, Dick sent me a letter, and I just want to read a few excerpts of, from it. A, a lot of a lot has been made of Norm's role in transplantation, which was the offshoot of the myocardial preservation technique. But you and I well know infinitely more lives were saved worldwide by the Shumway method of myocardial hypothermia than by transplantation. I well remember a day in Paris, he thinks it was in the 1960s, when I was watching one of the French hotshot cardiac surgeons who said to his scrub nurse, donnez-moi le Shumway and there was the little plastic catheter to be sewn to the pericardium. Norm had clearly arrived. One last vignette you may not have heard. I don't think I ever saw Norm lose his temper. Coolness under pressure was his special trademark until the day he returned from an interview with Garrett Allen at the new Stanford Hospital in Palo Alto. The lab door slammed loudly as Ray Stouffer and I waited for news of the interview. Garrett had told Norm he, would, he could join the faculty, but only until Garrett could recruit a big name cardiac surgeon. Well, we got Norm calmed down and per persuaded him that the deal might be okay. And as they say, the rest was history. Dad also had the pleasure and honor of working with uh, Margaret Billingham. And uh, she taught him a lot about how to treat rejection. And uh, Philip Caves, the uh, uh, young man from Scotland, was able to do a lot of fine work in uh, developing the instrument for transvenous endomyocardial biopsy. And you can uh, tell there's a lot of respect being exchanged here. It's important to have heroes, and they don't all have to be surgeons. In fact, sometimes none of your heroes are surgeons. But uh, one of Dad's heroes was Roberto Clemente, who in addition to being just a superb athlete, uh, was really the uh, Jackie Robinson for the Hispanics, and uh, also was very involved in humanitarian activities. Uh, there are certain Shumwayisms. I think many of them are well known to many of you. Do not panic is the first one, and this is what he learned from Walt Lillehei. Uh, when in doubt, keep operating. Uh, and that's one I've repeated several times to my residents. Uh, it's always darkest before the dawn. All bleeding stops, dot, dot, dot. The pump is your friend. And then there's the code, magics. And I've, I've gone to, um, on many a donor run, where somebody would ask for the magics, and then I'd know there was a Stanford connection. We are very grateful that Dad did not have bangs like Kirkland, that he did not sell facial cream like Barnard. He was nicer to his trainees than DeBakey. That's not saying much. And he never declared bankruptcy like Cooley. <laughs> we, we always wondered if Dad was going to get around to writing his uh, autobiography. Uh, a lot of people with fewer credentials than him have, have done so. Uh, but he did get as far as his... Uh, 
first paragraph, and this was the introduction. He was going to title his memoir, 16-106-106. I can certainly understand why one might find, one, one might consider 16-106-106 a strange title for a memoir. When I entered the Army as a buck private in March 1943, soon to join an infantry replacement training center, I was the first man in my group at the Scott Field Induction Center to memorize his Army's serial number. This required minimal cerebral activity. If I were ever to become a prisoner of war, it would be amusing to see what reaction might derive from recitation of my serial number. Fortunately, I barely qualified as a marksman with the Garand M1 rifle, let alone attained POW status. I did, however, accrue three good conduct ribbons. One can see that my military service presaged the so-called Yellow Berets of the NIH during the doctor draft years. More about this later. So we can only imagine what the rest of the book would have been like. But I'm sure there would have been some excellent laughs. And this is uh, the group at Dad's uh, retirement in 1993. As recently as at the AATS presidential address this year, Irv Krohn quoted Dad saying in his presidential address that the hardest thing about cardiac surgery is getting a chance to do it. And the people in this photo, as well as others, have carried on this message and made sure that people are well trained and, uh, and, and suitably uh, able to make good judgment calls in performing cardiac surgery in the future. And sometimes I'm asked what it's like to have a famous father, and I usually say, well, I don't know, I never had uh, a real one, or a real famous father. And, uh, but he, he, I think the hardest thing about having a, a relatively famous father is that you have to share them, even when you don't necessarily want to share them. But we're, we were happy to share his uh, legacy and his uh, thoughts and dreams and I uh, thank you for the opportunity of giving this talk in his name. Sarah, thank you very much. Glad that happened now. Yeah. So why don't we spend a few minutes? Are there any questions that uh, any of you might have for Sarah? Any comments? Okay. All right. All right. Well, before you uh, step away, this is a small token of our appreciation oh. for taking the time and effort to put that wonderful lecture together and spend oh, with great. us. Oh, great. Oh, it's uh, heavy. accept this uh, small gift of appreciation. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.